first of all, I really want to thank the New Frontiers team for actually giving us the stage and in, in the time to actually talk to you about our passion. Um, this is going to be a little bit out of this world, literally, so <laughs> bear with us uh, as we become so excited about like, what we want to uh, actually do here in New Zealand. Um, you want to drive? Yeah, I'll drive for first. Okay, so, um, so the title of the talk is Democratize Space. And really what we want to do is to create this space ecosystem uh, in New Zealand, create a new industry. Um, so, but before that, maybe um, I'll just give a little bit of a background of, of myself and, and Eric. So I call home uh, the Philippines and the US. I'm originally from the Philippines. I'm actually a dual citizen. And uh, when I grew up, um, I fell in love with space and never recovered. Yeah, and it doesn't matter whether Philippines doesn't have a space agency, we didn't have an aerospace engineering program at all. And I'm actually not good at math and science either. <laughs> but I think the stubbornness actually got me through like physics and space science and, and, and my master's in, in, in earth uh, sensing. Uh, because I had a dream. Um, and I think uh, probably if there's anything that I can say about uh, my background is like anybody can actually do this. Um, and so I spent the kind of like the, 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 the last three decades of my life either working to work for a space startup uh, that is uh, opening up access to space, uh, writing a book on the future of space flight, uh, and then also um, working and building on global ec educational ecosystems in technology and space. Okay. Um. Yeah, some of my background, uh, I started in uh, physics and gravity theory and black holes and uh, astronomy, mapping the galaxy. Uh, then I became a space engineer um, and worked on uh, the design of the International Space Station uh, for NASA and then uh, and studied all the ways you can blow up a space shuttle. For uh, I spent a year studying the first six seconds of launch and now I can't watch a launch without you know, being freaked out, but, um, and uh, worked on for big companies and little companies and uh, taught at International Space University for, in a bunch of com countries, uh, and uh, recently been working on uh, ways to protect the Earth from uh, asteroids that might hit it, uh, working with NASA on that, and, uh, but if anyone lands a rocket nearby, I'll be happy to climb on board. <laughs> So, so let's tackle the, the, the question of space, because most people say, well, we have so much problems here on Earth, why are we even actually looking at space? Uh, there's this misconception that space is always just like big government, like big budget, uh, you know, space exploration for exploration's sake, going to Mars, going to Moon, um, you know, science and technology, all for its own sake. But we actually forget the fact that you know, we use these technologies every day. You know, from our GPS in our phones and in our cars uh, to when you look at the weather uh, in the morning. Um, all of these things, like from TV to cable, like we take this, all of these for granted, uh, and especially for a country like New Zealand who's like rich in, re in national resources. Um, these are actually services that we need um, and they're not just like good to have. So one of the other things as well is that um, I actually see space as, um, as related to the future of, of the planet and the future of humanity and, and us as a, as a multi-planetary species for, uh, in, in the future. Um, but also, it also is a global grand challenge and that's a whole other uh, talk that we can talk about um, uh, later on. But at the same time, uh, space is also an applied technology that can actually potentially um, solve some of the global grand challenges from energy to food to water and so forth. So it's really something that's, uh, that's really important. So again, going back to New Zealand, what is the benefits of, of actually working uh, in this kind of like uh, uh, field? Again, as I mentioned, New Zealand is a, a resource like rich country. And what better way to actually have like all of these uh, you know, services, space services, to be monitoring um, and, and actually sustaining uh, the planet, all homegrown from here. Um, and not just 
uh, to serve New Zealand, but also to serve the rest of the world and become like a leader in this. So there's a, there's a really great opportunity to actually create like a space, a new whole space industry through, for example, through, for, through research and development. As we've been talking about uh, before, New Zealand is a pioneering country. It's in the culture of being innovative um, and, and uh, actually creating new things. Uh, so that's one thing that I think uh, is is going to be, to benefit New Zealand. The other thing as well is that we can also create a whole new workforce uh, that is uh, working on space activities and, and space initiatives. And that's not just, uh, we're not really talking about just hardware, but we're also talking about software. Um, there's, of course, uh, engineers and scientists and rocket scientists that can actually launch uh, things in space. But with satellites that are not proliferating, there's a, going to be a whole uh, amount of data that are coming and needs to be analyzed. And we are going to be needing computer scientists and data analysts um, and so forth. And that can, uh, that's already something that uh, the tech community in New Zealand is already uh, uh, quite inherent. Just to give you an example, the, this image of, of New Zealand, uh, it, collect this every couple of weeks, and now it's going to be more rapid that we get uh, uh, mapping of the entire country this way. Uh, so you can actually see uh, health of, of rivers and bays and uh, things like that. Uh, and there's, we'll talk about some more sensors that are coming up. So just as uh, uh, some statistics, today the global space community actually is, consists of about Oh, well, it's now over 58 countries. This is data from 2013, uh, all the way from superpowers like the US and Russia and China, uh, but then also to little countries like Luxembourg, um, as well in, in Turkey and, and Algeria. So there's definitely that, an opportunity there. Um, and also just to point out that the global space market today, most people think that it's more government-based, but it actually there's a bigger uh, market uh, in terms of about $200 billion in the commercial uh, side uh, and um, bigger than the civilian side that we normally know, know about. So how are we actually going to do this? Um, you know, I'm very privileged that I have lived in uh, Silicon Valley for over eight years and I see the coolest, greatest technology that come and go. Uh, but, but again, that's changing. The world is changing. We really live in a really interesting time today because uh, exponential technologies, are, these are technologies that are rapidly accelerating and growing at an exponential pace. So robotics, AI, uh, AI um, nanotech, biotech, these are technologies that are actually democratizing, demonetizing, and dematerializing all the goods and services that we have uh, today. And these are the things that we can actually leverage to actually create uh, this new industry. And, uh, uh, so this, these new technologies, which have, you know, a lot of us experience through like this, how the smartphone is um, suddenly so powerful. I don't know if you realize that the smartphone is, your one phone is more powerful than all the computers that the Pentagon had when they were fighting the world, Cold War. It's, it's equivalent to 60 times the Craze 2 supercomputer. Uh, and so when you click on the agreement to your, start your phone, it says in the, in the fine print, uh, you will not use your phone to design nuclear weapons. <laughs> it's actually in the Apple. Or else the Apple lawyers will come after you. And, uh, so, so these uh, technologies have rippled through all these different space areas. Um, and, you know, Rocket Lab in, uh, is take advantage of the propulsion adva uh, advances. I'm going to talk about a few other ones. Uh, I'm going to talk about the spacecraft and the, and the sensing technology and, and some about the manufacturing. So uh, first off, uh, CubeSats, uh, suddenly you have the uh, very powerful spacecraft uh, in these tiny little packages, only 10 centimeters on a side. and. Uh, so they're becoming like the Swiss Army knife. I mean, it's like originally this was designed as a as a little package that people could learn how to make a spacecraft. But now, with all the powerful computing, uh, the most powerful computers in space are being launched on these tiny little spacecraft, and they're doing uh, amazing things uh, with uh, picking up radio signals and uh, and some of the uh, uh, sensors I'll be talking about. So. Uh, Instead of $100 million you know, multi-ton satellites, now we're 
little ones that fit in your hand. And uh, Rocket Lab is planning on launching about 20 of these at a, in a shot every launch. So here's a very powerful little CubeSat. Uh, it looks about the size of a coffee cup here. And, and it, but this, uh, you can have a, uh, a telescope in there and a computer chip, uh, a sensor chip, and uh, take images like that image of, of Washington, D.C. down there. And uh, the, the company Plant Labs is making these by the batch. Um, so they have 140 up there right now. And uh, here's, uh, and one thing you can do when you have tiny satellites, you can spread the sensors out over the orbit. So now you have a, you're taking a scan of the entire planet this way. And their, their aim is to uh, scan the entire Earth every day. And so in previously when uh, people would, would document illegal logging in the Amazon uh, two weeks ago, and they would you know, uh, criticize it, uh, now you can actually see the loggers while they are there, and the government has already intercepted uh, illegal logging based on the quick scan of the, of the whole planet. And so they're, they're, the goal of this company is to do a, check the health of the planet every day. Um, I'm really disappointed that I, I missed my chance to bring this for a demonstration here. It, uh, my little software-defined radio arrived three hours after I left to come here. But uh, basically, an ordinary tracking ground station to get the data from these satellites, it cost half a million dollars. Uh, but now you can get the, with the technology, you can get this uh, same image for $30 if you have a nice little number eight wire antenna. And so another powerful transition is hyperspectral imaging. Uh, 10 years ago, I worked on this uh, instrument for NASA. It was half a ton. It cost $700 million. Uh, and it was able to take images in 100 uh, different colors. Uh, and now that all fits on one chip for, uh, for it's still $50,000, but it's amazing. And so uh, and what, what you, can you do with this uh, sensor? Well, you can, uh, ordinary cameras are three color cameras. Uh, this one is 100 colors, and so you can actually identify species. You can even identify the health of the plant, depending on the spectrum of the uh, plant and the species. So we, we're trying to make a promotion to introduce this. Uh, we have, we're working in this company, and Emily will tell you more about that, but the, uh, uh, trying to use New Zealand and tracking invasive species from space as a test case. And we think... Uh, we can start flying drones uh, perhaps at the end of the year. Oh, and one more area is this. There's now, you've heard of 3D, you have uh, 3D printing. Well, the, uh, some of our students uh, five years ago was started a company that uh, made 3D printers and put them on the space station. And now, usually when something breaks on the space station, you have to wait three months for the next delivery from the ground. Uh, whereas uh, they tr surprised this one astronaut when he said he was lost his wrench somewhere in the space station, and then they, they emailed one to him. And so, and the, the astronauts, when they, they operate these 3D printers like little microwaves and the, they're controlled from the ground, so they open them up and they don't, it's like a Christmas present. They don't know what's inside, and they say, my wrench. So, was, so they were very happy with that. And this, eventually, the, the idea is that you can launch this raw material up into space and build a spacecraft that could never be launched in one piece or any pieces. And so you can get tremendous new capability that can only exist in space. So I know we have uh, only a very little uh, amount of time left, but I just wanted to kind of maybe rattle a little bit uh, more examples of like startup companies that are actually leveraging the technologies that Eric has talked about. So he talked about hyperspectral imaging. Hypercubes is this two-person uh, 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 startup, uh, one Australian, one Brazilian, and now they're basically leveraging and taking that small small sensor that is now the size of a thumb, putting it, uh, sticking it into a, a, a nanosat, uh, and essentially 
actually now they're, uh, they're basically partnering with the World Food Program to see if they can actually help the, the WF for uh, monitoring like food production as well and, and uh, the health of plants. Uh, they're also partnering with a nonprofit organization to look for chem chemical weapons uh, as well. Um, and so these guys are looking for actually a ride up, uh, if you know of anybody who can launch them. Um, another company that we're partnering with, uh, 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 Endurance that is from Bulgaria, um, and because it has uh, the access is actually so democratized as well, is that now we have an online store for satellites. So these guys can actually uh, configure uh, what you need, like in a few minutes, and then in five days they can actually give you the satellite. So again, um, th this are this is one guy out of Bulgaria um, that is actually working on this. There's a, a bunch more um, examples. So we have one 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 uh, student as well uh, from Singularity University, like five years ago, didn't know anything about uh, space at all, but really wanted to do this open uh, open source like um, uh, earth sensing uh, constellation of satellites. Now he's got four satellites up there that, that he's launched through some from the Chinese, some from from the Russians, but but and he's actually doing this from Patagonia. The other thing, uh, another example here is that uh, about two months ago, uh, Africa is actually saying that they're going to be launching their first satellite, and it's designed by high school kids from South Africa. So again, this is like just just to, to let you know that this is not out of this world. Uh, it's been democratized, and, and it's actually in the hands, the technology is in the hands of anybody who want to actually uh, just leverage it. So we want to help whoever wants to make the first New Zealand satellite. Yeah. <laughs> so, so again, Eric talked about uh, Planet Labs um, uh, earlier. This guys, this is actually the garage that they kind of like started with in Cupertino. Uh, it's it's really three guys in a garage, um, and now today they have over 150 nano satellites up there. They actually has have the biggest constellation of satellites, and they only started uh, launching three and a half years ago. In two days time, they'll be launching like 88 nanosats um, up, which is unprecedented. Yeah, um, and the, 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 the cool thing about this as well is that in 2014, they had 26 satellites that actually, uh, they blew up on, uh, on launch, like uh, orbi uh, Orbital uh, actually didn't make it to launch. And so uh, in normally, like a company would have been like devastated and done with, but because the technology is just so fast and, and changing that they already have like new satellites on the pipeline and they wanted to actually launch those new ones as opposed to the ones that were, were uh, being launched. So th this is uh, certainly something that uh, I think is really, really relevant to New Zealand because, um, again, sensing for climate change, disaster response. I mean, um, you know, it's a, a very agricultural country for food security uh, as well. And as we can see with, with, with the, 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 uh, the weather and environment, environmental monitoring is very, very uh, um, important. And so we've gone from being a bystander to actually becoming a participant in this like space movement to create an industry. Yeah, so now uh, in only a few weeks, uh, Rocket Lab will make their first launch attempt uh, near Hawke's Bay. And uh, I always say attempt because of the, of the 11 com companies that have tried this, uh, building a new rocket, uh, eight of them have failed on the first try, but they eventually succeeded. So uh, good luck for, to Rocket Lab. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so uh, they, in, in fact, they have such an ideal spot that, you know, as soon as they announced their vehicle, they, they sold out two years worth of launches. Um, they're, they're so popular around the world. Uh, everybody is watching for this launch that's coming up. Uh, they're even, uh, uh, some people that we work with, uh, uh, they're even going to be launching to the moon from New Zealand at the end, towards the end of this year. Um, with this uh, small lunar lander, uh, I used to work on. I used to be the run this uh, lunar lander design, but back when it was bigger, and now it's shrunk down because of the technology. Uh, and so we're the, some of the competitive advantages for New Zealand. One is just the location you can launch uh, without the constraints of ship and air traffic that other places have. Um, uh, and you have and Rocket Lab has built their launch facilities. And, and built the, this uh, very cleverly designed rocket. Uh, but you also have a, a, a whole base of education and high tech 
and uh, existing entrepreneurial ecosystems, we may need a few more uh, uh, domes uh, for our ecosystem. But and, <laughs> and we uh, we also um, uh, and also a very responsive and progressive government uh, in this area to uh, to encourage activity in this area. So I know we've kind of like don't have uh, time left, but at the same time, I know that we are, we're also going to have a discussion session this afternoon. Um, so just le let me probably um, end kind of like in, on this slide where, so how, how are we actually going to do this in, in, in New Zealand? So for us, we don't know the answer. <laughs> I just want to say that out uh, on the bat, and we're, we're basically experimenting. We want to co-create uh, with you. We want to be part of, of, of this community to actually create this. Um, with our experiences, at least from the past, creating uh, educational ecosystems, um, this is sort of like the roadmap that we're looking at uh, to see how this could potentially happen. Um, and so for, uh, for us, like, um, education is for sure one of the biggest thing you know, you can't just like launch rockets. Uh, you need to have a sustainable, um, you know, a sustainable uh, workforce that can actually um, uh, sustain that industry um, for a long period of time. Uh, and the good thing is that education is, has also been disrupted. You don't need a four degree in like aerospace engineering to actually get into, the, into this uh, business. Uh, we've been talking to uh, a number of uh, digital education platforms uh, that can actually do this and also traditional space, uh, traditional um, uh, training uh, programs like International Space University and the Global Space Institute who, who can actually bring this to New Zealand as well. Um, then uh, the other component to this is like having a, an entrepreneurial and a technological hub um, that can actually sustain and, and have startups that, like start looking at uh, potentially working on, on space initiatives uh, on this. Um, and New Zealand already has the tech hub um, and again a drones, uh, you know, a, a drones uh, like inventor or engineer can easily be ported to become a satellite uh, engineer uh, today. Uh, it's it's no longer that like prohibitive. Um, and if you have that, that that ecosystems and you have that like sustainable communities like accelerators and hubs that can potentially again a fraction of that be ported to like looking at uh, at space. Uh, then that's sort of like you're, you're halfway there. Um, but one thing to point out, uh, as well as most uh, companies or most space companies actually die there uh, because uh, in the traditional sense, it's always too cost prohibitive. The technology to develop the R&D is like just too big. Um, but today, again, going back to the exponential technologies, because it's now gotten cheaper, faster, and better, um, we can actually kind of like bridge that gap uh, to do that. And the ecosystem is the most important thing. Technology, technology cannot solve everything. It's the people who will solve everything. And the, the people who have the willpower to actually take that technology and put it into practice. And so I think for us, again, we're not only like just looking at this um, on the New Zealand scale. Our goal really, as, as you know, Lauren was talking about uh, earlier, I think we're going to be a multi-planetary species in the, in, in the far future. And it's not just you know, the superpowers of the world, like the US and, and, and Russia uh, and, and China, who will actually get us there. We want everybody to have that capability to actually be part of that, that solution and not just by, be bystanders. And, and I think New Zealand can be the pioneer for doing that new space uh, movement that we all want to, want to do. So thank you. <laughs>